Hey guys, today I have one of my favorite type of videos to do. This is a VET bring back, a P38 brought back by Kenneth Bridges. But before we jump into that, let me just let you know that uh, Memorial Day is coming up. That makes this uh, video all the more appropriate. But for Memorial Day, I have a special treat coming your way. Uh, we're gonna put out a video on Friday morning for Memorial Day. So make sure you check that out. Now, the second thing that I have that is special is some giveaways. I have a bunch of giveaways over here. You can't see them yet, uh, but I'm gonna be giving away some items at the end of the video, and that way, you'll be more likely to watch the video, and then at the end, participate in some of the giveaways. So, first, let's talk about this gun and the man who brought it back. Okay, we have several things to look at. First, the gun itself. You can see it's a nice uh, blued gun uh, from 1943. And that's a BYF, so it's the Mauser factory. I'm going to take this down a little bit for you and show you more, but let's just go through everything that came together. Here's the holster, and it's barely visible because it has a rub mark there, but that is 1944 P38, and that's the maker code, KKD. Uh, typical P38 holster. There is a spare magazine, and this is actually post-war. You see the Walther banner right away. I know it's post-war P-38 because the wartime and pre-war did not have a Walther banner. So somebody put a post-war magazine in here and that's just fine. Probably they wanted an extra magazine when they took it to the range. Uh, there are cuts here and I'm not sure what that's about. That is not normal, but it doesn't interfere at all with the value of the holster because you're actually buying the assembly. Uh, which includes the bring back papers and does add value. Most people ask how much value. Bring back papers can easily add 15 to sometimes 25%. Now, if, this, if it's somebody semi-famous or with a really interesting story, it can actually add more. Uh, this one, Kenneth Bridges, we really don't know much about him, although he was from Pennsylvania, near and dear to our heart. Um, and it does have the serial number of the gun. Notice we've talked about uh, papers before that most of this happened when the war was over. And sure enough, this is May of 1945, so the war had just ended. Now, just so you know, uh, from what I can tell, Kenneth did not get back to the United States until about October, and then he was discharged in November of 1945. Uh, I mentioned before that they had a lot of time. Uh, they are actually helping uh, a little bit to rebuild the country, but they spent a lot of their time picking up souvenirs, uh, sightseeing, and meeting some of the locals. I th think that would be the best way to put it. Uh, this is in glass, and I just wanted to comment. Some people will put it in like sealed wrap, uh, and that will ruin it because you can't ever take the seal off. This is fine. Uh, it preserves it, but you can take it apart and still pull it out uh, to get to the to the original paper. The former owner put together this little dossier on Kenneth and there's a picture of him. As I said, I don't have a story about how he captured it, but we can kind of un unfold a little bit about uh, his service uh, in the United States Army. Uh, he was in the 66th Division. This is brand new, so I think somebody ordered this online and put it together with this. So in other words, when the, um, the family of the vet probably sold this at some point, and so the gun and all the papers, they probably were together from the family of the vet, but this was probably put together by a collector as well as this. Nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, I always tell when families of the vet want to uh, sell these items, I always ask, are you sure? And then I say, are you really sure? Uh, because I think it's a shame to give away uh, or try to sell these. But what I do assure them is once they have decided to, to sell or give away these items, I always say this will go to the hands of a collector who will revere and honor the memory of your relative. And that's exactly what happens. There's rec rooms all over our country uh, with memorabilia from our vets. And this person put together a, a really nice dossier. Now, I turn the page and we see this is his honorable discharge. I already mentioned it happened in November, and that was uh, Indian Town Gap, and that's right here in Pennsylvania. Uh, he was part of a field artillery battalion, 60, uh, I mentioned 66th uh, Division. But what he actually did was he was a truck driver. I guess te technical, 5th uh, grade, 
Um, that, that I usually think of somebody technical as in we have high technology in our weapons, but back then uh, it meant something very different and it seems in this case it was, he was a truck driver. You can see uh, he was, uh, they mentioned the Africa campaign, so he came over in 43. So he went to basic training in Fort Rucker, which is in Alabama. You can see he qualified on an M1 carbine. In fact, he, he uh, was ranked as a sharpshooter. That's pretty good. Uh, and that was in September of 43. He must have gone to uh, Africa for a brief period of time, but he spent most of his time in the uh, European theater, uh, most notably uh, throughout France. And then he, uh, truck driver of a light truck, uh, and what he did is he transported ammo and shells uh, from, from the rear up to the front. Uh, basically driving back and forth, uh, re reloading, and it was the 105 millimeter artillery shells uh, that he was bringing up to the front. Uh, he was originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. You see his height and weight. Seems like he was pretty skinny, 5'10 and 175 pounds. Uh, now this had something to do with his, what he was qualified to drive. It looks like uh, he was qualified on an army staff car, a coupe or a sedan or a coach. That I think would be a Jeep. His preferred uh, vehicles were Ford, Chevrolet or Plymouth. Uh, no Teslas at the time, so he did not qualify on the Tesla. Uh, and then there's a map of the 66th Infantry route. One of the notes I read uh, mentioned that they, uh, he spent most of his time in northern France, so I believe this was the route that he took into Germany. And there were some pictures of a death camp, so I know that they actually entered into Germany. 66th Division, uh, they were known as the Panther Men, and you can see a Black Panther here. That's not a political party, but that is, in this case, uh, the company that he served in, uh, 66th. And uh, there is a telegraph note, but there's nothing in it. It just says, congratulations. So I'm not sure what that telegram had in it, but I opened, uh, well, it's cut at the top and there's nothing inside. So I don't know what message that um, sent other than a promotion or perhaps even I'm on my way home. In paging through the book, right in the beginning, that was their, uh, their commanding officer for the 66th Infantry Division, Kramer. Not a part of Seinfeld, different one. Uh, I don't think there's any relation there. Um, and I'm just going to page through. You know what happens whenever I do this? I start paging through and then I can't put it down. <laughs> this was at uh, Camp Rucker, I think. They had a marching band. They had mud. If it was in Alabama, yep, there's mud. And uh, it seems to me that it would be red mud. Uh, there they're parading through the streets of the town. Uh, notice here that Kramer has a 1911 on his hip. A little bit later, I'm gonna show you a different weapon that he was carrying. Um, uh, they were practicing, I don't think that's Europe or Africa. I think they were probably practicing on the beaches near the camp. Actually, fort, not camp. Learning how to rescue their friends. Uh, now, their when they first came over to Europe, the first stop was England. And um, you can see, I guess that's, uh, King George, and uh, that's part of the English countryside. Uh, you can see here, uh, probably London, but he, there's some pictures. These are, I started to say his pictures. These are not his pictures. This is from the book. When they were transporting over to Cherbourg, um, they were, one of the transport uh, ships was uh, sunk by a submarine. I think it was five miles off the coast. I think most people survived, but that just is an artist's rendition of the sinking of their transport ship. They obviously saw some snow. Now I believe they're in France. Um, this was uh, actually what he was doing. This is the, I believe the uh, 105 millimeter artillery. And so he was part of the unit that was driving the trucks to bring them their ammo. Uh, as a matter of fact, here you see it. Uh, 105 millimeter gun crews. And he was servicing those gun crews. Now. Uh, the danger of that is it's, it's, I read a little article about it and they said they often drove at night um, and with no lights on, on windy, muddy roads that were being shelled from time to time. Uh, this one, it said it, they actually sunk a ship. Uh, so uh, there's a, they painted a ship. He's, he's, they sunk a ship. That's a 155 millimeter 
crew. Uh, oh, and there's the uh, Panther Man. See the Black Panther on his shoulder. There is an uh, observation, climb up a tree to observe. Here's one of the commanding officers. Uh, this is uh, General Junk and Hopman Mueller. Uh, that's uh, when they surrendered to the 66th Division. And there was a copy of the uh, surrender paper. You can see the Germans and the Americans during the surrender. Uh, they filmed it. Uh, there's some interesting pictures of uh, the, the Germans surrendering to the Americans. It actually seems uh, pretty hospitable. Um, there's uh, French soldiers, you can tell from the top of the cap. The, so the French were, uh, French were there along with the Americans and of course the surrendering Germans. It looks all very dignified. Uh, here's uh, somebody surrendering the weapon. I'm thinking um, P-38. It's in a holster. Could be smaller caliber, but he is surrendering here. And there's uh, Kramer, uh, General Kramer, accepting the surrender. Again, French, German, American. Here's a collector's uh, dream come true. Uh, look at the pile of helmets and notice the leather linings. They look brand new. Wouldn't you love to have them in those conditions? Uh, so these troops were pretty, uh, pretty fresh because uh, they would be stained after, the, you know, after you wear them for a while, especially in the summer. Um, you can see how clean these are. Not all of them, but they all look pretty clean. So they were probably fresh recruits that were surrendering. Remember, he was uh, carrying a 1911. Well, that is either a 1903 or 1908. Uh, and they were um, issued to officers. Most of them did not go out till after the war. We've talked about those before. Most of them were made in 44, 45. Again, uh, general officer's pistol. Uh, a lot of them ended up being issued in Korea and Vietnam. But in this case, uh, there's his Panther uh, insignia, and he's carrying a general officer's pistol, so he downgraded. The German is surrendering as a better view of his um, surrender weapon. It is a small caliber, uh, 7.65. Uh, it is not a P-38, it is not a Luger from the front. It, I would say a Sauer or a Walder PP. I can even see the safety here, 60 degree safety. So I'm gonna say it's either a, a 38H Sauer or a Walder PP. Now, I know some of you are gonna comment, that's fine. Um, I'd love to hear your opinion, but that's all it is, it's an opinion. And, and that, that's pretty much it. You see the, uh, the French ladies are all celebrating. And then there was maps, and uh, I like this one. You're now entering Germany, don't fraternize. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying, don't, don't get involved with the locals. <laughs> You're not staying. Um, you can see the bombed out cities. Actually, that, um, as many times as I've seen that, it really hits me even more now because of what's going on in Ukraine. It looks like some of the cities in the Ukraine, and that's exactly what happens in all out war. It's, it's just sad to see. War's over. Everybody has a chance to get their teeth checked. Gotta love that. <laughs> Couple more things I wanted to point out. One is that looks like De Gaulle, um, and they're marching through the streets, so probably somewhere in France. So uh, there's a picture of De Gaulle. And then also I mentioned that they, uh, into Germany, they did uh, go to one of the death camps. This is actually one I had not heard of um, because it's one of the sub camps, Evansy. Uh, you hear about the main camps, Buchenwald and Auschwitz, but there were actually about 47 sub-camps uh, that kept prisoners uh, during, during the war uh, that were liberated at the end. Uh, so I just wanted to show you a little bit about this book and the work of the 66th Division. Now, whoever buys this assembly, it all comes together. Um, uh, one other thing I wanted to do is uh, take the gun apart. Okay, for those of you who are new to this, I wanted to focus on the gun a little bit. I already mentioned BYF was the code for Mauser. It was made in 1943. It's in the M block. You see the suffix at the end. Uh, M block is probably about a mi the middle of the run. Uh, you also can see a Waffen stamp, and that will be Eagle 135. You may not be able to see it, but uh, that is the inspector stamp, the military inspector stamp. And then on the other side, you would expect to see three stamps. Uh, that is the military inspection stamp of 
Eagle 135, followed by a test proof and then another 135. Every once in a while, these are out of order, and so you'll get two military and then one firing proof, but this is the normal configuration. Um, now, you see the reddish grip. These are actually made for the Walther factory, but for a lot of the time, Mauser got the grips uh, from the Walther factory. They would order grips, um, but they also made their own black grips look like this. Uh, they're a softer plastic black, but either one is correct. Don't mess around with grips unless you know it, like it's a post-war grip and doesn't belong uh, because people often will switch them around, but this could be exactly the way it left the factory and how it was captured, so why would you want to mess with that? I had already taken out the screw just to make it quicker. Uh, you can see the back of the grip. They do have uh, insignias talking about, so that's how we know where it was made. Uh, there's a whole, there's actually a whole book written about the different kinds of uh, grips, uh, but it's a harder plastic, not, the, if you do the soft, soft plastic, it makes more of a thud noise. This sounds like cassonettes, so you know these are original grips. Uh, the magazine, by the way, uh, often will be one, well, let's take one thing at a time. You see the P38V, uh, that's mid-war, uh, correct for mid-war. The spine of the magazine is, uh, for uh, Mauser would be Eagle 135 or Waffen 135, Waffen, I should say. Uh, in this case, it is Eagle 359, which is made by Walder, but again, I wouldn't automatically switch them out because they, uh, they did get parts from Walther. So the, in this case, the grips came from Walther, the magazine came from Walther. All the other parts are 135, which is um, Mauser proofed. I popped the grips back on just because it's easier to hold. Um, the screw's not in it, so I have to be careful. With a magazine in it, when you pull it back, it'll stay back. I just want to give you an idea of what else to check to make sure it's all matching. You do want to check here and here, their matching numbers, and then the barrel, darn it, I did that prematurely, the barrel you can see matches. So you check here, here, and here to make sure it's all matching. The only other place that you would check is the locking block, and that should have the last three digits of the serial number on the locking block. See the Waffen stamp here? Excuse me, the Eagle 135 from Mauser. Uh, take, down, take down lever. And then I slide it forward, drop the hammer. See how gently I did that? I'll do it again. Just drop the hammer and then it pulls forward. Oh, it doesn't pull forward. And you know why? <laughs> I forgot to put the magazine in. Okay, take the magazine out, drop the hammer, and then it pulls easily forward. Uh, the spring should be in the white. You want to check that. If it's been refinished, then uh, the springs will be blued. Um, but the springs are in the white. You, even the trigger spring inside, you can see it's in the white, and that's correct. The locking block should not be blued. And right here, you do see the last three digits. You also see the M. To take the barrel out, this is the reason they call it the locking block. See how that locks in? Push that pin and it pulls right out very easily. You can check and see that the bore is mint. Then also you will see on this side, there's again an Eagle 135 on the locking block. So everything is matching um, and everything is proofed and just, just the way it left the factory. So this was the gun brought home by Kenneth Bridges and to Kenneth, thank you for your service and to his family for the sacrifices they made. Now, so some of the things you learned is not only how to take it apart, but to make sure it's all matching and then also to check. Uh, remember, we decided that this was post-war. That cuts the price. It goes from 120, 150 for a wartime magazine down to about 30, 40 bucks for a post-war magazine. So those are important things to check if you're a collector uh, picking up a new treasure. Now, you can't just watch one gun. So I have one other gun, has nothing to do with this. Uh, they did not come in uh, together, but they did come in on the same day, and that is a G-Date Luger. I just wanna show that to you really quickly, and then we have some giveaways. Okay, so this is a G-Date rig, just came in today, and again, when I get a gun, I like to inspect it to make sure it's all correct, and there's something to learn on this one. First of all, 1935 holster is the rarest year. The reason being, they made a lot of holsters in 1934. 34 holsters are much more common. 
but they only made 10,000 Lugers. So they didn't really need uh, very many holsters in 35, but this, this particular maker from Dresden, uh, they did make, uh, uh, I don't know how many they made, but they are, they are pretty rare. So for example, a holster like this sells for about $1,500, 12 to $1,500. It is military proofed, uh, and that's a 35 era Eagle with the Waffen Inspector stamp. Um, this side, the, the holster is really nice. This serial number or rack number uh, does not match the gun, but it is for a, this is a military approved holster. Uh, so I'm not sure what the 902 stands for. We do have a G date in here, and I wanted to show you the tool as well. Uh, Randy's going to have to work some magic to be able to see it, but um, just because the markings are really faint. Now these, these uh, early G-Dates, there's the G-Date, G-Date S42, which is the factory code. These early ones had some rare proofs on them. So they, it makes them uh, more desirable, a little more expensive. K-Date has the same proofs and just the earliest of the G-Dates. But that's a W154 and then an S92, followed by the, um, those are Waffen proofs for the military and that would be the uh, test firing proof. So those are the three proof marks that you see. These are all correct. You can see some fire blue on the pins and then you see the beautiful straw yellow parts. Check out the grip strap. This is just a gorgeous gun. Will be all matching numbers. Uh, and you can see it here, here, here. The trigger will be matching. Uh, if we took it all apart, I'm not going to take the time to take it all apart. You'd see every part all the way down to the firing pin is numbered and matching. However, grips on G-dates are mostly, about 90%, not marked. So the grips are not numbered. So then you just look for a tight fit, and this looks like a very nice fit. Um, and I men remember I mentioned the tool. This tool is W154 as well. So it's a pretty rare tool. Again, the tool can be two or three hundred dollars. Uh, we mentioned how rare the, the uh, holster was. But the next thing to check is I'll take out the spare magazine. Now you can see the early magazines were nickeled as opposed to a blue magazine. Um, most of the magazines uh, made during, well all the ones made during the war. You can see here they are a blued tube as opposed to the nickeled tube. This one comes with two magazines with the nickel tube, so that's correct. And two matching magazines. Now we do need to talk a little bit about these magazines. Uh, but again, you're a collector and you're looking into maybe buying this. You can see um, that the suffix is B and the serial number is 4585. Now most of the parts will just have 85. 85. You can see it's a funky looking five, but G-Date and K-Date do have just a unique five, which you should see. I'm going to talk about the serial numbers because you always have to check when you have two matching mags. There's no signs of grinding here. They're not flattened, like nobody ground it off and renumbered it. Here you don't see it uh, ground off and renumbered. You see that they both have the B and they both have the uh, Eagle W154, which is a rare magazine. However, this one looks perfectly correct. This one, it looks pretty darn good, but it was stamped over, meaning there is another number underneath there. Now, that doesn't have to be the kiss of death, so you right away have to ask yourself, is it faked? Well, it's not faked if the Germans recycled it and restamped it. Remember, they were, they were making these for war, not collectors, and so they wouldn't throw a magazine away, and let's say they messed up a magazine and they decided to reuse it, and so what they did is they just restamped it. So this one, I'm sure it has one matching magazine. This one is a little bit funky. So whenever you buy a gun, I always say buy the gun, not the story, and sometimes you have to tell a story to explain it. So I'm just telling you what to look out for. I'm not 100% thrilled with this magazine, but it also, it, it, the, the font and everything, the size, and the, there's no, there's no um, grinding here. It looks pretty darn good, but 
it is an overstamp. So the way that I'll list it is one magazine with a second mag magazine, which is an overstamp. And I think that's the best way to describe it. By the way, you can see the plus sign. That is correct. Plus sign means the spare mag. Okay, I just threw that little quickie in as a bonus. Uh, no extra charge for the Luger, but I thought you might be able to learn something from that. But now it's time to give away some items. Okay, I'm going to start off with three books. If you're interested in a giveaway, you know what to do. You write, I like free stuff, and then tell us what you would like. Um, again, I prefer, don't require, I prefer people who haven't won anything yet. And also our patrons. Love to see our patrons get some free stuff because they help support the channel. And we want to help support you in your collecting habit. Uh, three books. Let me tell you about these three books. First, History of Firearms. This is something published by Legacy Press. And it gives, as the name would apply, gives the history. It's a resource guide. It's mostly early antique guns. In fact, it goes up to 1900. So it's not modern weapons. We're going to give that away for free. I like free stuff. History of Firearms book. These next two books are really special because you wonder, why in the world am I giving away a copy of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens? And that's because you can hide your favorite uh, gun in there. This actually had a PPK in it. Uh, if you have a library in your house and you want to hide a, gun, hide a gun, you just tell the robbers, don't go near the Oliver Twist book. But that's pretty cool. I figured you'd love that. And same way with this. This is a French book by Thomas Hardy. Somebody's, somebody's going to write to me and tell me what this book is about. 1895, and you open it up, and this one actually held a P38 in 9mm. So these are free. Just let us know. I like free stuff, and let us know you want one of the hollowed out library books, or I guess we can call it a gun case. What the heck? This is from Home Goods for $8. I'm giving away $8, but with inflation and everything, uh, since the new regime started, uh, inflation now, this would be about $108. A couple of more quick things. I still have, remember I talked about gun rugs, gun holders. Uh, we still have some. If you're interested in a free gun holder, rifle, or pistol, just tell us I like free stuff and uh, specify rifle or pistol. Uh, we'll give them out for a little bit longer. Uh, then I have some random random ammo. I don't like having ammo sitting around the building because it accidentally can be put in a gun and that's a really a bad thing. This is actually 30 odd six. Uh, there's a green tip. Do you know what that means, Randy? No. Okay, we don't. Oh, I know. It's for Greenpeace. Uh, that uh, brings about peace in the world. So we have green tip and a 30 odd six. Uh, uh, ammo, uh, just random if you want that. I can't use it and I want to get it out of the building. And the best for last. This is a picture taken 1945, Northfield Tinian Island, where the Enola Gay and the Bucks car. Um, this is the Hiroshima mission and the Nagasaki mission. And it is signed. This is uh, the co pilot. Here it is. It says uh, Fred. U.S. Air Force retired co-pilot box car, and that's the Nagasaki mission, August of 1945. So this is signed and it's framed, and somebody's going to treasure that. So if you would like that, we'd love to make it available to you, and thank you for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel, and remember, next up, Friday, uh, through the weekend, Memorial Day, I've got a very special video to show you, and i got lots more to do, so stay tuned.